Today we will discuss how to examine a patient as he comes to the hospital, the first step, general examination. General examination is a process whereby the doctor or the student deliberately seek certain informations. It is not a casual observation. It's a focused, pre-planned, organized way of looking at the patient. As the old saying saying, what the mind is ignorant of, eyes cannot see, hands cannot feel, ears cannot hear. So you specifically look for certain things and you get idea about the patient. If the patient is in the ward, but in the bed, you approach the patient and three things become clear to you. The patient is reading newspaper, that means he is a well person, not much problem with him. Or he is breathless, he is not that well. Or third category of people may be at the end of life. So we have seen how a patient in the bed is, first impression. Alternatively, as the patient walks to the outpatient or to your room consultation room, you can see how he walks. Neurological diseases and joint problems make the patient limp and somebody may be helping them. As he gets into the room, undresses and gets to the couch, we know how breathless he is and how much difficult it is for him to walk, get onto the couch and undress. So you are getting very important information regarding this patient. Then you are looking, even before you specifically look for certain things, you may have some visual impressions about this patient. His appearance, very cheerful person, depressed, gloomy, how well he is dressed, how well he has groomed his hair. So appearance and behavior be a clue at the beginning itself. And there are certain things you can immediately spot as a diagnosis as the patient comes to you. For example, acromegaly. Even before you make an examination, you make the diagnosis. Cushing syndrome, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism. The patient may be having classical phase of SLE, systemic sclerosis, dermatomyositis. Or the patient may be having classical neurological diseases like Parkinson's disease with a mask-like face and pill rolling tremor, you made the diagnosis there itself. Examination may add few extra points, that's all. You may get a myopathic face, you may get classical myasthenia patient or a wasted temporalis, masseter, sternomastoid, drooping head, drooping eyes, dystrophia myotonica. The lips of the patient may tell you the diagnosis at the beginning itself. Puch Jagger syndrome, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. You may just look at his nose. He has got saddle nose, syphilis. Or it may be vaginist granulomatosis. Cauliflower ear. You may think something wrong with him. Vaginist again. Or maybe relapsing polychondritis. His complexion may itself will give you some clue to the diagnosis. So there are certain things you can immediately diagnose as the patient comes to you. That's called first impression. Somebody with the bilateral enlarged parotid, bilaterally enlarged lacrimi glands speaks of the diagnosis itself. So that is the first impression you gain from the patient. When we go near a patient to examine, even before you test the patient, we may get peculiar orders. If somebody who has consumed alcohol, it will be very clear. If it is coming from a uremic patient, it may smell like ammonia. If it's a hepatic encephalopathy, it may be a sweet smell. If it is a diabetic ketosis, it may be smell of acetone. And then, of course, smell of fecal matter, immediately think about jejunocolic fistula. You may be vomiting fecal material. You may get very foul smell when the patient is suffering with atrophic rhinitis or suppurative lung disease or malignancy inside the oral cavity or somewhere like that. So this order, when you go near the patient, may even give clue to the diagnosis. An unconscious patient, smell of kerosene, immediately we think about organophosphorus poisoning. Then you are looking at the height of the person, how tall he is. Is he normal? Unusually short, unusually tall. We have to measure the height of the person. Measurement requires certain rigid criteria. Criteria number one, he must not wear any footwear when you examine his height. We must have a hard platform 
on which the patient must stand. And then he must stand erect. And there may be measuring tape attached to a vertical bar behind him. And a sliding object or a block that comes up and down and touches his scalp and stop. And at that particular point, he will be looking straight ahead as per Frankfurt plane. Which means the outer canvas of the eye is, goes along to the tragus. And, and that line is parallel to the floor of the room. That's the position in which we have to take the height of the person. If you feel he's unusually tall, then you have to go for further examination for Marfan syndrome, pharmacist Nuria, or Kleinfelter syndrome. Suppose he's unusually short, you'll be maybe looking for Turner syndrome, maybe hyperpituitarism, congenital hypothyroidism. You have a couple of differential diagnoses coming to your mind. Suppose he is having too much height, you may have to take his measurements further. Limb span. Limb span is commonly measured from the suprasternal notch, mid suprasternal area, to the tip of the finger and multiplied by two, and that is the limb span. Similarly, you have to take the upper segment, lower segment, which is done by making the patient stand up from the pubic symphysis. To the heel is the measurement taken and then you subtract it from the height then you get the upper segment this is how we look for upper segment lower segment relationship so you have measured the height of the person and accordingly you have proceeded further to see the limb span and upper limb upper segment and lower segment these measurement segments and up limb span not routinely done for every patient but in people who are unusually tall similarly you find Next step has to be the weight of the patient. For weighing the patient, you need to have a weighing machine and make sure you are calibrated to zero before you make the patient stand up there with light clothes and no footwear and see the weight. And then you calculate his body mass index. Weight in kilogram divided by height in meter square gives you the body mass index. And every race has got their own normal range and Asians have got normal range and you have to convert it and see whether it is fitting into normal or otherwise. If the body mass index is high, in only that category of patients, you have to proceed further. Couple of things you have to ask the patient immediately. Do you snore at bed? You snore when you sleep? And do you feel sleepy now and then and go to sleep when you drive? No. Daytime somnolence has to be asked for. Then you take his waist and hip measurement. How to take the waist measurement? You take the <coughs> midpoint between the iliac crest here and the, sorry, iliac crest here and lower clip margin and take the midpoint between the two. At that time, you take the measurement, that's the waist measurement. Then you take the hip. Hip is the area where your maximum diameter over the, this is the hip measurement and then you calculate waist hip ratio. Also you measure his neck circumference at the upper level of thyroid cartilage. These measurements are done only for patients in whom you think they are overweight or body mass index is high. Also you look for the mid arm fat you can use a skin caliper and measure the amount of fat present over here and it can be compared with the normal tables available. Alternatively, if you think that the patient is obese, you have to go for subscapular skin pad thickness as you've done at the level of the mid-arm skin pad thickness. That has to be done. This is how you basically look at the basic measurements of the patient in obese patients always look for acanthosis nigricans, velvety skin lesions seen over the neck, skin folds, axilla, cubital fossa, and inguinal region. This may indicate insulin resistance or internal malignancy. Also look for skin tags, the neck, or around the shoulder or axilla. You may get clue to the diagnosis of insulin resistance. Then you are looking, in general, how he is 
behaving to you and then you may give introduce yourself and shake hands with him so as you introduce yourself take care his hands are not very painful and hand is a gold mine very good lot of informations when i am shaking hand i can see his nails what's the color of the nails this is pink if you unusually red i think polycythemia if it is blue i may think it is cyanosis or it may be argyria or it can be ochronosis if i can see the splinter hemorrhages i think a clue is there for endocarditis or vasculitis or if you find periangual capillaries you can make a diagnosis when you shake hands you can see how warm the hand is or how cold it is to compare thyrotoxicosis from anxiety and to see whether the hand is moist or dry you are also having a feel of his grip and you can see the how much flesh is there fleshy hand as if you are passing the dough you made a diagnose acromegaly or if he is not able to release don't release release that is myotonia so simple diagnosis you get from there itself you can see the wasting of the small muscle of the hand when you are shaking hands and also you can make any other observations like red palm like in cirrhosis liver so one important thing you look for in the hand examination is the deformity of the joints abundance notes and when you shake hand he may wince because arthritis of his joints so take care when you shake hands with this patient then we are going to look for whether he is pale or not please note pallor is not anemia pallor is observation of pale conjunctiva anemia is a lab diagnosis pallor is a sign anemia is a lab diagnosis so this is how you will look for pallor you wet the both eyelids and simultaneously look both eyes because if you examine one eye alone that eye may be red because of local pathology you can also look at the nail beds palmar creases for pallor but best source site you had look for is the conjunctiva then you are looking for jaundice and classically you ask the patient to look down and you can see the color over there if it is yellow if it lemon yellow hemolytic anemia if it's orange color it can be obstetric jaundice is greenish hepatocellular jaundice whenever you see jaundice color don't jump into conclusion there are only three diagnoses it can be gilbert's disease as well once you have finished looking for jaundice you are looking for cyanosis so common sites you look for cyanosis in our climate in kerala is tongue and nail beds but in parts of india where extreme winter is there you can see cyanosis in the lips or in the ear lobules elsewhere but here we see only nail beds and the tongue if the both tongue and the nail beds are cyanosed we call central if only the peripheries are affected you call it as peripheral cyanosis then you are going to look for edema in this patient when you look for edema classically in a patient who is walking around you look some bony prominence and press over here how long to press if there's edema as and when you press you may get yet pitting and then you know there's edema is there if it's not pitting maybe couple more seconds you pit and see whether pitting is appearing delayed or not pitting also helps you to say so immediate pitting as in hyperproteinemia or very delayed and slow with resistance as in case of chronic edema so by just examining for edema you can make out it is bilateral unilateral painful painless easily pitting or slowly pitting as in chronic edema please make sure if you find edema both sides from a very young age it is likely to be congenital lymphedema now it's very common never ever miss the diagnosis so you have seen the pallor you have seen jaundice you have cyanosis then you look for clubbing clubbing you can look straight like this and clubbing can be easily seen like this very rarely very rarely we go to see fluctuation which can be seen by putting two fingers and pressing each other nail bed and see how fluctuant it is alternatively you can look for shamrock triangle these two tests are not commonly required if there's clubbing it will be very obvious 
at the beginning itself and lower limb clubbing may be there upper limb clubbing may be there or only one side there may be clubbing so once you have finished clubbing you are going to examine the lymph nodes now let us go to the first the lymph nodes of the neck we have put as circles here is a upper circle where is the lymph nodes in the submandibular area submandibular area you got preauricular postauricular occipital so i will put it like this i will tilt the head to the same side a bit and examine for submandibular lymph node submandibular lymph node bilateral preauricular postauricular occipital so i do this from the front i will go behind and look for the longitudinal group along the trapezius margin posterior cervical lymph nodes also from back i will see for supraclavicular lymph nodes lateral and medial also i look for deep cervical lymph nodes medial to the sternomastoid muscle on either side also i will come to the front and palpate specifically for scaly nodes between the two heads of sternomastoid ask the patient to bend a bit to relax and palpate between the two heads so you have lymph node submandibular submandibular preauricular postauricular occipital so simultaneously you can do couple of them and from the back we have got horizontal group posterior cervical we have got deep cervical then we have got midline in the submandibular pretracheal and the space of burns this how we look for specifically for lymph node examination once you got lymph node you tell how many are there what is the size are they discrete or matted is it tender is it adherent to the skin deeper structures and what's the consistency consistency may be described as soft if it is like palpating your own lip it may be called firm if it is palpating like your nose or hard if it is you are palpating the bone of your chin so description is variable now comes the examination of axilla it is not that difficult but you have to be very observant to find out how to do it when i am palpating the right axilla i am using my left hand and putting like this and the patient will be resting his arm on my forearm and then i am palpating the central group apical group medial group i palpate like this for his lateral group and when i come to the other side i am doing like this right hand his left arm resting i'm putting my hand on the shoulder and palpating over here and lateral group i'll be palpating like this coming to the epitrochlear lymph node i'll be palpating just medial to the cubital fossa over here and the site for epitrochlear lymph node then as a part of lymph node examination i also have to look at his tonsils and then go to palpate the lower limb lymph nodes particularly the inguinal nodes also sometimes you may get popliteal nodes so we have finished pallor jaundice cyanosis clubbing lymph node edema now we have to examine his thyroid i am examining his thyroid from the front i ask him to swallow i can see whether it's enlarged or not then i have to go for detail examination if thyroid is palpable then i am looking at his hair a, a gentleman who is hairless requires further evaluation a lady with a beard or who is bald again requires evaluation so when we say hair we are specifically looking for certain things then we look at his skin as such what all things we can see the skin may be totally pigmented as in the case of b12 deficiency addison's disease over the pressure points creases same with b12 deficiency internal malignancy makes you black it may be the pigmentation because of drugs like amadaron you that made you totally black in color there may be areas of vitiligo that gives a clue it may be autoimmune disease there may be multiple scars of repeated episodes of herpes zoster as in the case of retrovirus infection or may be multiple warts again giving you the clue whatever you see on the skin you have to mention there are a couple of diagnoses that can be seen by examining the skin as in case of sarcoidosis you may get classical lupus pernio you may get erythema nodosum of the shins 
in many conditions. That can also be seen over here. And whatever comes to your mind, you may always give as a diagnosis. After making the diagnosis of skin and hair, you go back to nails again. What are you going to look for the nails? We already mentioned about clubbing. Now we are looking for spooning of the nails. There is no spooning. Spooning may, may appear early in lower limbs than the upper limbs. Then you are looking for whether he has got pitting or onycholysis. Is there any hemorrhages which may give a clue to the diagnosis? So there may be white nails, there may be red nails, unusually red nails, there may be yellow nail syndrome, yellow nails, or there can be blue nails. All different colors may be there. So clues from the nails are also important. Once you have made this much examination, you are going to look for your vitals, pulse, blood pressure, respiration, and temperature. For recording temperature, you had to use a digital thermometer or even mercury thermometer if you, you can use in the axilla. People who are really sick, like who are having sepsis or scenarios like tricyclic poisoning, when you are suspecting hypothermia, low reading thermometers has to be used and rectal thermometer or low reading thermometer has to be taken care of. This is the summary of general examination of these patients. As you already said, as the patient walks in, you are looking at his gait also, that comes as a separate talk. Thank you.